Welcome to How I Got My Start in Finance. In this episode, co-founder of Panning Capital, Kieran Goodwin, tells Tony Greer how a book, an unexpected business opportunity, and his interest in programming led to a pioneering career in the world of credit default swaps trading. Well, I really liked basketball uh, growing up. I played, you know, in high school, and Duke actually went to the finals uh, my junior year, 1986, wow. which was the first time, uh, which actually it was Johnny Dawkins who... Your junior year in high school. In high school, right? My junior year in high school was 1986. Uh, Johnny Dawkins was a star who actually just coached against Coach K last Sunday on the, yeah. you know, at, at UCF. His, his son had an amazing game. Yep. So that was Dick Vitale, you know, prime time when he was really uh, ascending as a, as a star commentator. And he would constantly talk about, you know, how the Cameron crazies and all these kids give an amazing amount of support to Duke and, you know, cheer, but, you know, their future doctors and lawyers and, you know, from the Northeast, I don't know about you, but I, I never really heard of Duke outside of right. kind of basketball. I didn't really know that it was a great school. Mm -hmm. So that summer we did, you know, saw some colleges. We did like a little Southern tour, went to UVA and UNC and uh, Duke and a couple other schools. And you, when you get on that campus for the first time, it's an amazing place. It's like, you know, some of the best decisions I've made in my life are come from the gut, right? When you're like, this is right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I walked on there and it was like, well, this is amazing. Yeah. I actually didn't end up, I ended up applying early to Brown, got deferred, uh, didn't get in, but got into Duke. So it was kind of like, I'm glad it happened that way. Yeah, yeah, that turned out well. So when you got out, were you making a beeline for Wall Street? Did you know that that was in your blood and where you wanted to go? Or were you sort of feeling you're out your options? Well, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, and I, I think I'm, I'm fifth generation, probably boroughs mostly, some like Lower East Side, but so I have a lot of New York ties. So I knew I wanted to come back to New York City right. after, uh, after college. Uh, and my junior year, we were just getting back in the beginning of the semester in January. Uh, good friend of mine, great friend, great friend of both of ours, Keith Melchioni, he gave me a book. Uh, he's like, oh, my dad got this for me. He's mentioned in the book, and I think you might like it. And, you know, Keith is pretty much, uh, what's, what's this guy, Nelson DeMel? He's like a Nelson DeMel guy. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. So this was, this was the book was Liar's Poker. Okay. So, uh, so I'm a junior. It's like we're having a keg party at the fraternity, which is like the 600th keg party. Like, you know, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. this before. <laughs> so I'm sitting there. It's about seven, 8 o'clock at night, and I start reading it. And I, I literally read it in one sitting. Like, I, I read yeah. it from 8 to whenever, 11, 11. I mean, it's a quick read. Yeah. I, most of the stuff at that point I didn't understand mm -hmm. as far as, like, mortgage securitization. But I was like, wow, this is this is kind of speaks to me in the sense yeah. that I, I always liked to gamble from when I was, like, my grandparents told me to play poker when I was probably 7 or 8. Yeah. And we would play just games for money in the family, whether it was, like, Yahtzee or cards or we'd bet on – the Kentucky Derby, whatever it was. There was just like Rain a- drops, whatever it was. Yeah, so we, I had that and I always liked angles. Like I was looking for, I didn't even know the word for it at the time, but arbitrage is in a sense. Yeah. I mean, in college, I, uh, my good friends, a uh, good friend of my father's, he owned a bar in Brooklyn and we, would, we were in, we were in the city or in the, you know, visiting my grandparents and I would notice like people were selling Christmas trees for like 50 bucks at the time in the late 80s. And, and so I went to back to Reading, and we had a Christmas tree farm a couple miles from my house. How much can I get a tree for? It was like 15 bucks. So then I, I rented a truck the next year, got a buddy of mine, we got 50 trees, drove it up there, and, you know, sold them in front. Yeah. It, it was good until I learned two lessons. Like, there was an arbitrage there. Like, yeah. so I think our all-in costs were like 20-odd dollars, like 22, we were selling for 50. But then... The best lesson of it, though, was like as you're getting up to Christmas Day, right? You know, 23rd, 24th. We were there for like a week. We might have had 100 trees. I can't even remember. But you start getting bid for trees, and I'm like holding. But I have an option. Like a tree is like an option, right? And yeah. on the 25th, it expires. It's worthless. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So people were bidding me like 35, and I'm like holding price, whatever. I should have just been hitting every 35, yeah, yeah. 30. Because right. I was still making money. And like that was, I remember thinking when I started getting a risk position, uh, first it started to be able to handle risk positions. I was thinking of that moment, like, you know, 
Yeah. Sometimes any bid's a good bid. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, you've got this drive in you and that you're that entrepreneurial and calculated and you go from your fraternity reading Liar's Poker and next thing you know, you're on credit derivatives desk on Wall Street and a pioneer in CDS trading. Yeah, well, it wasn't as much of a straight line. But right, no, I know that, I know that, and we, that's why we're here. We're gonna go through a little bit of the path of how you got there. So tell me about your earliest Wall Street days and a little bit about, um, you know, was it just in credit? When did you get your exposure to credit derivatives? When did you start taking on risk? Um, come, you know, going from a young kid out of college on the desk to becoming the guy that was, okay, Kieran's got a, a book of his own now. But tell me about the early days, the transition from, Duke to, okay, I'm on the desk now. Here we go, and I'm selling Christmas trees. Right, exactly. Uh, so I was uh, a computer science major. So I like math. I like logic, computer, uh, programming. At the, and I felt like even though that skill set I wasn't using right away, I always felt like, you know, understanding logic and problem solving that you learn and in, encoding in, in is helpful. So, but my first job, I was working in the equity department at Smith Barney, and uh, you know, we were a group that was doing all the stock buybacks. So I was an analyst, then I became a sales trader. Uh, and I, I wasn't really using those skills. And I, and I started reading about or hearing about derivatives, whether it's in the journal or just tangentially. So I tried to get a job in equity derivatives and like started you know, hearing about option theory. And I'm like, oh, that's math and I can understand that. And there were no jobs. So then I got a job. Uh, Smith Barney started an interest rate desk, interest rate derivative desk. So. I got a job up there and I was like the junior trader, let's say, but it was just more uh, working with the model and, you know, putting, put, you know, pricing swaps and swaptions. I wasn't really, I didn't really have risk. Mm -hmm. And then the head trader got fired. So then I was like thrown into the seat of having risk and uh, having to deal with that, uh, which was, you know, baptism by fire. Yeah, there it is. And which was great, but like scary at the same time when you're yep. like 25 years old. So, so that trader then had went back to where he was from at Citibank. Eventually our whole, Smith Barney did a whole uh, tack on fixed income. They shut down derivatives and they asked me to like trade treasury options. But then I also had a job with this guy at uh, Citibank doing credit derivatives, which was totally new at the time. Mm -hmm. And having seen other people be successful at interest rate derivatives, you know, having been there in the beginning or equity derivatives, Interest rate derivatives probably started in the early 80s, equity derivatives kind of mid 80s mm -hmm. in, a, in a real way. Yep. And then, you know, now we're in the mid 90s. I'm like, all right, well, this makes sense. You know, credit derivatives. I knew a bunch of people, friends that were trading corporate bonds and high yield bonds. So I had some uh, familiarity in how big the product was. Right. So, uh, yeah, I started working with him in credit derivatives in 95. He soon abandoned me. So I was by myself and he abandoned me because there was no business. So being a credit derivative trader in 1995 meant you basically spent a lot of time talking to yourself. Right. <laughs> you know, I right. So I'd come in every day, I'd have a book you know, about option theory, I'd learn about, I'd read about credit, I'd go talk to the b corporate bond traders, the loan traders, and they would just pretty much you know, shoo me off after me bothering for 15, 20 minutes. The phone was not ringing off the hook yet. No. Right. But it was, it was a good time in the sense I was young and you know, I had a lot of time to study and read and try to figure things out yeah. for myself and observe. After reading Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker, Kieran Goodwin's interests shifted to finance. He even used psychology behind options trading to sell Christmas trees. It's all the small things that helped shape his view of the world of credit. For Real Vision, I'm Justine Underhill.